Weddings are pagan by nature in the wearing of a ring, which symbolizes the ring of Saturn. Funerals follow the same pagan-derived ritual when a sacred geometrical tomb is placed over a grave to embody and immortalize the spirit. Baptism is a ritual to submerge a child in holy water to symbolize the renewal of life, just as rain replenishes the earth. The Holy Grail, filled with wine, is a representation of the blood that comes from the birth canal during menstruation, not the blood of Christ. This ritual was taken over by the patriarchal society. Males could not give life as women do, so to symbolize a male giving life was to draw blood, which could only be done by injury. In ancient Egypt, the goddess Isis was the personification of wisdom. Pharaoh Akhenaten changed the warship to himself as he proclaimed himself Amun-Re, the sun god. The word Amen at the end of a prayer spawned from the praise given to Amun-Re. From there, the Hebrews left Egypt and traveled north into the Middle East, where they encountered the Canaanites, who worshipped the god of Saturn, El. The merging of these three gods became the name of the land today, which is known as Isis, Re, El, or Israel. 98% of Judaism is based around the worship of Saturn. And the sacred day of worship is Saturday. The worship practice on Sunday is originated from the Egyptians who worship the sun god. Most people simply pass these things off and never question their origins, but this just scratches the surface of the pagan influence over the present day. It is not just found in religions, it is found right here in our own backyard. On January 22, 1783, Congress ratified a contract stating that all bills of credit emitted, monies borrowed, and debts contracted by or under the authority of Congress before the assembling of the United States in pursuance of the present Confederation shall be deemed and considered a charge against the United States for payment and satisfaction whereof the United States and the public faith are hereby solemnly pledged. The party that the U.S. owed these loans to? King George. I hope this paints a picture for you of how Great Britain funded both sides of the revolution. To this day, Great Britain collects taxes from the United States via the IRS. The IRS isn't even an agency of the United States government. If you don't believe me, look up IRS Publication 6209. The FCC, CIA, FBI, and NASA were never part of the United States government. The U.S. government only holds shares of the stock in various agencies. Social security numbers are also issued by the U.N. through the IMF. The Civil War, which lasted from 1861 to 1865, was also instigated by Amschel Rothschild to divide the United States and force it into debt with the central bank. The goal was to put the country of the U.S. back into the hands of Britain through huge loans taken out for munitions. To do this, it was crucial to put a controversial issue in limbo such as slavery. Knowing full well that the Declaration of Independence would create an uproar among southern states that depended heavily upon slave labor, it was signed in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania by 35 people, 33 of whom were Freemasons. John Brown was a Mason and a Rosicrucian who was brought to power by William Lloyd Garrison and Senator Charles Sumner, both descendants of the Illuminati bloodline. With the help of the New York Times, John Brown was built up to be a hero in the anti-slavery movement. Ulysses S. Grant, former president, was born Hiram S. Grant. This name was given to him by his father, Master Mason Jesse Root Grant. Jesse Root Grant worked for John Brown's father and then went on to work for E.A. Collins, one of the 13 Illuminati bloodlines. Ulysses S. Grant was brought to power rapidly with help from Collins. From April 1861 to May 1864, Grant went from the rank of private to commander-in-chief of the entire Union Army. Once Grant was appointed president, his cabinet consisted of eight Freemasons, including Alfonso Taft, which was William Taft's father, who was also an ancestor of Bill Clinton. 
Jonas Mills Bundy was one of the 13 Illuminati bloodlines who was also the presidential advisor to Grant as well as the next two presidents. And cabinet member Columbus Delano was Franklin Delano Roosevelt's grandfather. In November 21, 1933, President Franklin Roosevelt wrote, The real truth of the matter is, as you and I know, that a financial element in the large centers has owned the government ever since the days of Andrew Jackson. Abraham Lincoln's father was A. A. Springs, who was part of the Rothschild dynasty. Lincoln's half-brother worked for Louis Cass Pazur in the Merovingian dynasty, which was the 13th Illuminati bloodline. Pazur also owned Jekyll Island, which was where the Federal Reserve Bank was created. In the mid-1800s, Abraham Lincoln and the Whigs were trying desperately to keep Andrew Jackson from establishing a gold standard called the Independent Treasury System. Lincoln and his party fought to set up a central bank, making such public speeches as, under a gold and silver standard, all will suffer more or less, and very many will lose everything that renders life desirable. This statement resounds elements of scare tactics in this speech and other speeches on the matter given by Abraham Lincoln. They give no real evidence or explanation. In the early 1900s, after a failed attempt for Woodrow Wilson to set up what was called the League of Nations following World War I, Wilson and his advisor, Colonel House, set up the Institute of International Affairs. This institute had two branches. One set up in England called the Royal Institute of International Affairs, and the Council on Foreign Relations was incorporated as the American branch in New York on July 29, 1921. Founding members include Colonel House, J.P. Morgan, John D. Rockefeller, and a few others. A national income tax was declared unconstitutional in 1895 by the Supreme Court, but a constitutional amendment was proposed in Congress by Senator Nelson Aldrich. This makes much more sense when you notice that Nelson Aldrich was also known as being the authentic voice of J.P. Morgan and later married into the Rockefeller family. Today, 27 to 35 percent of American workers pay is taxed, and this money goes to a central bank called the Federal Reserve, or the Fed. For those of you who are unaware of the Federal Reserve Bank and what it is capable of, it is a non-government owned bank that provides the U.S. with all of its currency. They control the inflation rate by the amount of money in circulation. Yet the most amazing aspect of the central bank is the suspension of specie payments, in which the Fed can refuse to pay their obligations, yet taxpayers must pay their debts or go bankrupt. In other words, the suspension of specie payments is the central bank's right to breach a contract with no penalty whatsoever. In even simpler terms, it's called theft. How is it that the Fed is allowed to breach any contract they wish without penalty from the government? The answer is simple. The Federal Reserve Bank has power over the government instead of under it. Carol Quigley, Bill Clinton's mentor while at Georgetown University, wrote of central banks, They want nothing less than to create a world system of financial control in private hands, able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole, controlled in a feudalist fashion by the central banks of the world acting in concert, by secret agreements arrived at in frequent private meetings and conferences. It is important to note that nearly all of the founders of the Federal Reserve Bank were involved in the conception of the Council on Foreign Relations. Since 1934, when the Fed was established, almost every United States Secretary of State, all Secretaries of War or Defense since Henry L. Stimson, almost every head of CIA since Alan Dulles, nearly all presidential candidates, Dwight D. Eisenhower, JFK, Richard Nixon, and Bill Clinton were members of the CFR. George Bush Sr. was actually the CFR director from 1977 to 1979. Understand that all of these high-ranking government positions were lobbied into place by the organization set up by the international banking cartel. There are secret meetings held everywhere by many of the same members in the Trilateral Commission, the Bilderberg Group, the Club of Rome, the United Nations, and the two branches of the Institute of International Affairs. These groups make up what is known as the Round Table, developed by Cecil Rhodes. Other offshoots or preliminary groups are the Bohemian Group and Yale University's Skull and Bones Organization, which we all know George W. Bush, George Bush Sr., and John Kerry were all a part of. Most every meeting by these groups are attended by the most powerful government officials, corporate leaders, media moguls, and royal families in the world. 
These meetings are held in secret and not a word of them reaches the mainstream media.